Uh, you pass extras at the, at the end of the rows backwards. I think we're running a little low. Uh, Right, so welcome to my sauna. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get started. So, right, the lights. Yes. Uh, so close to the knowledge. <laughs> I do focus better. Yes. So, getting started, we are going to continue <coughs> looking at the world in terms of data and world states. We're going to continue to have training data, uh, and then, then we're going to try to do inference. But um, we're going to now talk about geometry. And so the reason I preface it this way is because normally uh, many, if not uh, most computer vision classes spend the entire time talking about what we're doing in this week, basically, or maybe this week and next week. They focus on the geometry uh, and they treat computer vision as largely uh, a sort of deterministic process where if you can um, if you can cast rays, if you can do triangulation, basic trigonometry, then you can do computer vision. And so it, it's certainly true that that's a very important part of computer vision. Historically, it's, it's massive. Um, so we're going to talk about it. But we're still going to talk about it in the same terms we've used so far, in part because the notation is very convenient. And so you won't have to learn many new symbols. You'll, you'll just be working with what you've already seen. Nonetheless, we have to introduce the pinhole camera model so that uh, we can then wrap our mathematical notation around it. So uh, we're going to go through the pinhole camera model and we're going to introduce the three geometric problems and hopefully we, we will at least touch on homogeneous coordinates today. Um, you should have slides for chapter 14 with you uh, at this point. On the way out, we will hand out chapter 15 uh, slides. It was hard to get them printed, um, and so I want to make sure you have them um, for uh, Thursday and Friday. All right, so let's get started on the pinhole camera model. The motivation here is going to be that uh, we might have I points uh, in the world. So these are 3D points somewhere in the real 3D world, and we also have to worry about their projection into our camera. So they, they have a 3D location uh, and they might have some kind of 2D projection in this camera. If you have two cameras, you might have two slightly different views of the same world, in which case you might be thinking, wait a minute, I see that same 3D point in both of my images. Maybe now I can figure out the depth to that point uh, and sure enough, if you calculate the depth of all of these points and color code it from red meaning close to uh, dark blue meaning far away, you get this sort of encoding, right? So we, if you try to ignore the grayscale part of the image and just look at the colors, you should see these points are close, uh, those points there are far away. We have lots of problems related to this that, that are sort of motivating us. Reconstruction of sparse point clouds, reconstruction of dense point clouds, uh, reconstruction of objects, sometimes static, sometimes moving, not just from one side, but from many sides, so multiple views. Uh, and all of these applications are going to depend on essentially the pinhole camera model. So the pinhole camera model um, is ignoring for now the idea of a lens. It's saying that there is a crazy world out there with all sorts of things in it where light photons are interacting with those things, bouncing off of them, 
and scattering in all directions. But if among those directions some of the photons bounce in this in this direction, then some of those rays might pass through our pinhole. This pinhole, you could literally think of it as a big wall where someone has drilled a tiny little hole and light is seeping through. And it's projecting into this, this fully enclosed room. Uh, so it's no coincidence uh, that my understanding, I don't know Italian, uh, but uh, camera means chamber in Italian, right? So we have this chamber where the light is projecting um, from the outside world, and maybe it's projecting here onto the back wall. Because the light is coming in, the top of the star there is coming down here, you should be seeing that this projection is upside down and reverse left to right. right. So um, the rays are coming in, we see this, this kind of flipped image. The, um, by the way, if you go to the, uh, if you go to Greenwich Park, they have the National Maritime Museum. You can see one of the earlier sort of camera obscuras. It's got the exact same principle, only they instead of sort of coming this way, they they have it up on top of a pillar projecting down. And so you you go right now ne right next to the the sort of prime meridian, this big silver line they've they've um, they've installed. There's this little round building. You go through two sets of curtains, uh, and you can look at this white table onto which they are projecting an upside down version of what's happening further down below at the, um, uh, at the bottom of the park. So uh, you can see this in action. One thing that I'll note is that the image is quite dim uh, when you look at the real camera obscura. For the simple reason that you can you can probably guess, there's not a lot of light going through this this little pinhole. Right, of all the light that's sort of bouncing around in the world, uh, only some of it gets gets through here. So you're seeing the right image. It's just it's just that it's very dark, which is the reason people introduce lenses. Uh, so we'll we'll touch on lenses, but we're not going to worry about them uh, too much because this real complicated world is projecting here into this inverted fashion. We find that slightly inconvenient. We're going to instead think about the same distance from the pinhole, the same projection of light onto this back wall of the chamber, but we're going to just think about it the same distance forward. So we have this virtual image in front of the pinhole camera. It's the same distance in front as this one is behind. But it has the added advantage that nothing's flipped, flipped around. So if everyone can accept that we're going to be talking about the virtual image, we can leave behind this, this problem of flipping, of flipping in both directions and just worry about 3D points projecting onto a 2D image plane and things at the top being at the top and things on the right being on the right. Is that OK? Yeah, the virtual image isn't meant to confuse you, it's meant to make things simpler. So let's, let's just use it that way, hopefully. All right, so we've got our camera, our pinhole, uh, objects in the world. Now let's introduce some notation so that um, this is consistent with what we've seen before. We're going to say this point in the 3D world is our world state, right? And we'll just call this UV w, so this is a curly w, but anyway, u, v, w is a 3D point in the world, and obviously we're interested in, as usual, the joint probability of x and w, so let me just label this, this is 3D, and in 2D we see that we have our x coordinates, this bold x vector representing the x and the y location on the virtual image plane. Right. Do it consistently. <coughs> and x and y here are just, these x and y are just scalars. All right, so we still got our camera model. The optical center here is 
where those rays were all intersecting. This is where the pinhole was located. We've got, we're calling this the optical axis. This is basically the middle of the camera pointing straight out. Now, the optical axis goes through the middle of our, of our virtual image. And it's tempting to say, well, if I have a picture that I get off my camera and it's uh, whatever resolution, a megapixel, 10 megapixels, whatever you like, it's very tempting to, to say, okay, uh, let's say it's a 64480 image. Uh, what distance is this? 320, right? And that's a very good guess. Uh, because and 320 is a very good guess because it's it's sort of half half the distance here. Um, now we'll, we'll talk a bit of, in a moment about pixels versus millimeters. But but first, why is 320 a good a good guess, but not necessarily the ideal answer? And the answer is uh, very simply: if you are the camera manufacturer, you have an assembly line. This is a very practical, pragmatic problem here. Uh, you have an assembly line and you're mounting the little CCD, right, which is our, our real camera image plane, right, but think of it as the virtual image plane, and you're mounting it in your camera behind the hole of the camera, which is, okay, there's a lens attached to it, but for our purposes it's the optical center, right? You might not get it exactly centered, so you might not put your CCD precisely <coughs> at the right height and the right depth so that the optical center is, is going through the middle of your CCD. Any amount of slight offset, and really we're talking about fractions of a millimeter here, right, will lead the principal point to be slightly shifted relative to the middle of your image plane. So for, for simple reasons of, of mechanics, we can't assume that the principal point is actually known with respect to your the images that you're receiving. And so it's something we, we may have to, to worry about and, uh, and account for in our training process. All right. I've already mentioned that this is the distance from our optical center to our virtual image plane is the same as it would be to our real image plane in the back. And that distance has a name. It's called the focal length. We'll be adjusting the focal length of our cameras at times, right? Whenever you change the focus on your camera, this is, this is getting adjusted. Um, and so we'll introduce a variable for, for that as well. Last thing I'll point out while we still have this slide up. Uh, we have this coordinate system. This is, um, we're always using the right-handed coordinate system. So you can always think of this just like x, y, z, or u, v, w. Right? If you're trying to remember which way <coughs> is W pointing, is it into the scene or out of the scene? Well, if U is pointing out of the scene and V is pointing down, right, um, then W is going to be pointing that way. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's always amusing during exams to see people uh, doing this, but uh, it's better to be amusing than to be not amusing uh, with the other hand. So. Uh, Right-hand rule. The other, the other thing I wanted to point out here is just think of the world really being uh, a 3D world and consider that I can move my camera around and uh, everything will, all of these parameters, the focal length, where the virtual image plane is, all of these things will, will move with it. But the 3D point might still be the same 3D point in the world. In other words, if I'm, if I'm, um, you know, putting this pen cap, if I'm putting this pen cap, and I'm saying, well, this is a very specific point in the world, right? Then I may move my camera around. I might have multiple cameras. I'm going to continue thinking of this as the same world point. This is the same world point, even if I decide to use a different coordinate frame, right? So I can arbitrarily say that that might be the origin of my world, and I'm going to orient my world sort of uh, this way. Or I could put my origin somewhere else. But the points in the world are still there. They're still going to be in the same 
relative layout with respect to each other, right? Um, it's simply a question of how we're organizing our our equations to express their location. So always, if you get confused, think of this world coordinate, right, as being this this thing that is dependent on the coordinate frame, which way we think is up, but relative points are always going to be fixed, so objects have a really fixed size. All right, so, uh, oh, sorry, when, when we, we're going to take this view, which is slightly sort of 3D-ish, and we're just going to rotate this uh, so that we are looking sort of at the edge of this virtual image, and uh, we'll still have the Y direction, but the, the X direction will be collapsed, right? You won't see the X direction in the next image. So here we've got the y direction, right? The x direction is sort of sticking out of the out of the world, and we're just going to worry about one slice of the the camera for now. So we still have <coughs> our optical center, the the pinhole itself. We have our main axis, and we fix the focal length to be one. Fixed focal length of one means we call this the normalized camera. There's there's sort of a, a unity here, and we want to know, well, if the focal length is 1, then where is this point in the world, W, projecting onto in our image plane? This is our, this dark, dark black line here is our image plane, saying what is the coordinate that this is. So it's some offset from the principal axis here, yeah? Uh, but how high or how, how tall is Y in this case? Well, conveniently, uh, these are similar triangles. So we could say, look, well, there's this bigger triangle here for the UVW coordinates of our world point. So the height of that is V, and the width of that is W. So we know that the ratio of V is to W as Y is to 1. And so that's indeed what we've set up here. V is to W as Y is to 1. So we can figure out, based if we know the world coordinate V and the world coordinate W, right, which are these last two, if someone told us that, we could tell where it ought to project to in our image plane. And the same is true for X, right, except instead of V, it'll be U u divided by w. Now you can think of w here. It's going away from the it's going away from the pinhole in the direction generally of where the camera is pointing. You can think of w as depth. Right? So we're saying, look, if you take the 3D coordinates location um, above the line or below the line, divided by the depth, that's how tall the y is going to be. Okay, now um, the one nor the normalized camera isn't always going to be available. Frequently, you'll have a camera with some other focal length, uh, and maybe it's worth illustrating uh, what happens with that. So let's let's just illustrate over here. I'm sort of shouting down, shout that. Is that okay? Can you guys hear? So. Um, Imagine that our, our image plane is this fixed height. It's this CCD that's got a, got a finite size. If I put my, if I put my um, pinhole right there, then I'm going to capture this much of the world. Let's say that's, a, that's our uh, normalized camera, right? Focal length of, of 1. That's a, that's a 1. All right. Am I going to see a broader section of the world if I move the principal point, uh, if I move the pinhole closer to the image plane or further away? Closer. Closer, indeed. So let me use a different color. Right. For the version where I move this closer, 
I now have these black lines as my field of view. Right, so now it's more like a, a wide angle lens. I'm seeing a broader version of the world. Will the same object look bigger or smaller in the in this scenario? Smaller. Okay. So clearly the scale of my objects, how they appear in my image plane, is dependent on the focal length. So here we have an example of a pretty large focal length, and here we have a smaller focal length. The world point, UVW, is at the same location in these two scenarios, in fact, in all four scenarios. But let's just worry about the top ones. So with this large focal length, the world point UVW is projecting onto point X, right, XY, and it's landing here, which, if you compare it, is much longer than where it's landing here, where the focal length is shorter. So our, let's say, reasonably sized object looked normal, but now the same reasonably sized object looks tiny, just because of the focal length. Interestingly, you can get the same scaling effect without changing your focal length. And this is what happens down here. And the, 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 the simple change is not one you can do on your camera yourself, but you can call up Canon or Sony and they can do it for you. By spacing out the receptors on their sensor, on their image sensor, on their CMOS or their CCD, by spacing them out to be dense or to be quite sparse, the same object will appear to be at pixel, let's see, a height of, I don't know what that is, 15 pixels versus a height of 5 pixels. Okay? So, the focal length is the same, but the inter sample distance, the spacing between the, the, the pixels is greater here than it is here. This is more dense. Reasonable, right? So we have, we have these, these degrees of freedom. But they have the same effect on Y. Or, or rather, they have interchangeable effects on Y. So if I tell you uh, that V is at this 3D location, and I tell you that the image uh, is 10 pixels high in, in terms of Y, you won't know necessarily whether that was because of the spacing of the sensor or because of the focal length. Now, we can try to calibrate for these things, but the, the confusion between these two will sort of always be there unless we actually have some specifications uh, about the camera being used. Okay, now, the thing that this, um, this is also wrapping up. So I'm, I'm going to introduce a variable for scaling is, is where we're going with this, right? And the scaling is going to explain this. It's going to explain both phenomena because we can't actually tease these two apart. But the scaling is also, uh, you should notice, helping us go from centimeters to pixels. UVW is in centimeters. Or you could choose to do everything in, in uh, nautical miles if you prefer. But this is a real world measurement. I'm going to use centimeters for now. The image plane has a focal length also in centimeters. So when we saw those equations previously, um, this was V over W, this was centimeters over centimeters. Units cancel out. So we've got this unitless, unitless Y. Um, here, because we have an interpixel spacing, Right? We might we can talk about the conversion from centimeters to discrete pixels. Yes. Sorry, just to clarify. So you didn't just change for that particular image. You didn't just change the spacing. You also changed the resolution of the camera, right? For the bottom, for C and D, we changed the resolution of the uh, of the camera, indeed. So if you would keep the same resolution, the other thing would be much. You, you basically increase the window. You would, you would have to draw the window much bigger. Uh, for the same resolution. For the same, yes, to have the same resolution, to have the same uh, 1200 pixels, we would have to have 
a shorter focal length so that we could get 1,200 pixels in this very sort of simple sensor. And so this is, this is one of those reasons that cameras advertise, well, they advertise for various psychological reasons by saying, oh, we have 10, we have 500 megapixels, right? Um, but the, the argument goes like this, CMOS is very hard to work with, it's very hard to get your sensors packed in very close and very tight, right? Uh, nobody wants to carry around a sensor this big that is, you know, um, a megapixel, right, sensor. So they try to pack it in very closely without hurting the quality. Uh, and so frequently when you, you pack in your sensors closer, it hurts quality. But if you, if you can avoid it, then you get more pixels for the same field of view. Right. And that's quite valuable, especially if you, if you keep these two points fixed, right, and pull this away, making your focal length very big, right, and then you're zooming in on something, and you're hoping that at the zoomed in level, with this, um, you, you, your object is still occupying a significant number of pixels instead of just you know, two. All right, so we have this scaling factor now to account for either the spacing of the sensors on the, on the um, CCD or the focal length. And so this, this, um, this scaling factor is just going to be phi for now. We're just going to have a single phi. Uh, and we can use that for both x and y. So we still have world w uh, coordinate. v over w is y to equals y divided by 1, but we have to have this scale factor in there. But instead of using the same scale factor for x and y, we're introducing different scale factors for x and different for y. So phi x and phi y. Why do we need two scale factors? Yes? Yeah, if the CCD has a higher density in, in x than in y direction. Exactly right. So at some point, uh, for many, many years, people said, oh, we'll just assume square pixels. Okay, and we won't have to calibrate. We'll just have one variable instead of two variables. And you already know where this is going, right? When you have more variables, you have to do more training, and it's a harder optimization. Uh, and so they always assume this. But then uh, mini DV cameras came out. Now, you may not remember them, but they, they were super cool. The first time you could, you could record this many hours on little tiny tapes. But their, their pixel aspect ratio, the number of sensors in X and the number of sensors in Y, the density of the sensors, was very different. It was actually a 0.9 pixel aspect ratio. So suddenly, you had to calibrate this, and assuming they were equal wasn't going to be good enough. All right, so we introduced a scale factor. Yes? So the ratio is the aspect ratio, right? The ratio between phi x and phi y is the pixel aspect ratio indeed. Okay. Uh, and it's, to be uh, more precise, it's phi x divided by phi y, vertical change over horizontal change. That's pixel aspect ratio. Yes. Sorry. Um, you say the x and the y are unitless because u divided by w removes all the units. But aren't we dividing x and y by the focal length, which is in centimeters? So don't x and y have to have a unit in centimeters to be able to cancel out the unit from the focal length? So we, we did have y in centimeters right. uh, divided by one centimeter. Right, OK. Um, and so we could move. Uh, with with that, we've we've moved from because of this, we've now moved into pixels because this is measuring how many this is scaling from centimeters to pixels. So we've reintroduced the unit now because of because of this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now I mentioned the principal point: how the sensor isn't necessarily mounted in the middle of the optical axis. Right. Well, that's this extra offset. So. You've got some 3D coordinate in the world. You can divide by the depth to figure out where it's going to go, but you've got to scale by this focal length type parameter. And after all of that, you've got to shift it by a certain amount in the x direction to compensate for the manufacturer's uh, you know, little glitch. In fact, the, the delta x, as long as we're here, is going to help us do one more convenient thing, which is, uh, I might go back to this. Uh, Instead of talking about this as the origin of the image, the delta x will just go ahead and, and use it to offset, you know, maybe a little bit, a little bit here. And we'll go ahead and use it to offset all the way up to the upper corner so we can always talk about images having their origin in the upper left corner. 
Okay, so that's our, our delta x uh, is, is going to be 320 uh, or 240 plus or minus whatever, whatever slight um, manufacturer calibration problems we, we have to account for. So, scale factor offset. Now, there's one more thing that the manufacturer can do um, slightly incorrectly or that you can do in some cameras uh, intentionally. So let's say I'm, I am the, uh, I'm the pinhole, right? I'm looking out that way. There's a ray going that way. We figured out that if that's my ray, if I get this sensor kind of in the wrong place, that affects the principal offset, this delta x and delta y. All right. What else might I do wrong? I tilt the sensor. Exactly. If I tilt the sensor, then depending on where in the y-axis I am, right, certain things will be closer, some things will be further away. So suddenly I have to account for this kind of skew. Now there are some cameras, maybe you've seen these, that these are sort of hobbyist cameras, which allow you to do tilt-shift photography, right, where you can actually manipulate where is the sensor and how is it oriented. Uh, it has some cool effects which we talk about a little bit in the computational photography class. Um, because it makes parts of the scene, like the top part, look quite out of focus, which gives it a, that sort of looking at a model, like a, a, a toy train kind of, kind of look. Anyway, unfortunately for us, because manufacturers might have a little bit of tilt, we have to add one more, uh, sorry, I have to add one more variable, uh, which is the skew parameter, which is this gamma here. It only applies to our x coordinate. Um, and it's basically taking the V, so it's saying how high was the object in the world, that's going to affect where things will appear in the X uh, direction. We could have um, tried doing the relationship the other way around, uh, but the point is now we've, we've got this connection, a V appears in the X coordinates. So this will, be, this will come into play uh, a little bit later. These are all the internal parameters of the camera. If I pick up the camera and move it around, all of those parameters are still with me. Now I can change them, but those are the internal parameters. There's also this question of where is the camera in the world? And so we have this separate transformation. We say, all right, we have our world point UVW somewhere in the world. Um, this, that appears right here. But depending on my overall calibration of where my camera is, right, I might put it um, over here or over there. Someone basically might have given me the world coordinate, the world location of W in one coordinate system, but my camera is sitting in a different coordinate system. So because of that, we have to bring these two into alignment. And that happens by taking UVW, transforming it so we have U prime, V prime, W prime, and this means that now what was the world coordinate is now expressed in the camera's coordinate frame. And we do that by pre multiplying UVW by a rotation matrix. So it's just a 3 by 3 rotation matrix of some numbers, we'll, we'll come back to those, plus some offset. So this rotation matrix, while it has nine variables is actually representing three, well we only need it to represent three degrees of freedom of rotation. Um, and these, this translation here is representing three degrees of freedom for translation. So in total you have how many degrees of freedom? Six. Six degrees of freedom. Good. Even though we have in total uh, 12 variables. So uh, we, we'll come back to that. We're calling this, this matrix of little omegas big omega times the vector w, uvw, plus some translation vector tau. All right, so the result of this is we have our point in the coordinate frame of the camera. Yeah? The camera is the one with the axis pointing in a certain direction. The, that axis is how we like to measure depth. Uh, and so that's why it's useful to have W prime instead of the W we started with, which might have been, you know, my, my pen cap being expressed uh, with respect to, you know, my nose or something. 
uh, which isn't handy if I'm taking pictures from across the room. All right. So, um, let's just see how we're going for time. All right. Um, we now combine the two equations, and we say, all right, remember our equation for x? Well, here we are taking in u and v and w, similarly for y. We plug in u prime, v prime, and w prime, and we get new equations for x and y. Let's just go through <coughs> y first, because it'll be a little easier. Right? We've got our scale parameter applied to the rotated version of u, v, w, rotated and translated, divided by what was previously just um, uh, was previously just w, right? Now it's this rotated version of u, v, and w, and translated. So the transformation involves all of the coordinates u, v, w, because it's not just depth anymore. This is, our, this is our normalization, and we still have our offset that comes at the end, our, our principal point translation in Y. The X is more complicated because we've got this skew parameter. Uh, in many uh, algorithms that you might read papers on, they frequently assume that the skew parameter is negligible or zero, just so that they can make these equations a little bit simpler. Uh, and not work and have one fewer variables to worry about. Yes. So why do we use tau x y z if we if we have for coordinates being u v w? Why do we use so tau is uh, tau and omega are two of our parameters, and we need them to convert. And this is this is happens all the time in graphics as well, right? Um, in graphics, we might say, all right, I've got a 3D CAD file, and that is 000 in the CAD file. I load it into a, a scene where I have uh, this as my coordinate frame, and my camera has its, co its, its origin right here. So whose origin is right? This origin or that origin? And the point of, the point of these transformations, this rotation, and this translation is to express that world location in terms of the, the geometry of this camera. Make sense? Yeah, it's just the indexes don't make sense. Right. Okay, so uh, <coughs> which indexes are you struggling with? We've got, uh, is, it, is it because we've got this, uh, there's two types of W? No. Um, so we've got. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's a mistake, I want to know it, but I, I'm pretty sure it's correct. But I, I, I would like to, you know, I'd like to be corrected if, if there is a mistake. So we're we're doing a, a matrix vector <coughs> multiplication here. So we're going to end up producing, right? This is a three by three times a three by one, which produces a three by one, right? <coughs> a vector. Uh, so 3 by 1 plus a 3 by 1 results in a 3 by 1. So the dimensions all check out. We're going to take u multiply it by omega 1 1, v times omega 1 2, w times omega 1 3, and add them all up, and that'll be the top element of that vector. So when you see um, where we would have had u, we are, are now having omega 1 1, um, Omega 2, 1, and so on, uh, multiplied in. Um, right. So, I is there a problem with the notation, or I is, it, is it okay? It's all right. It's all right. Okay, good. Uh, as I mentioned, we have our intrinsic parameters. This is our two scale factors. We have our skew. We have our principal offsets. We have our extrinsic parameters, our six degrees of freedom, represented as a matrix and a vector. We can shorten this to also be a matrix, just like the extrinsics, uh, and it'll be this lambda matrix. So this lambda matrix, three by three, where we have 
our scale factors, our translations, and this, this skew parameter, which only affects the, sort of the, the lopsided part of it, right? This should be nice and easy, right? This is nice on the diagonal, um, and this one is affecting x, because it's sitting up here instead of, instead of down there. So when you see capital lambda, this is shorthand for our intrinsic, our internal parameters, what's happening inside the camera. Extrinsic parameters are wrapped up in these, uh, these two variables. All right, we are uh, going to run into cases where we are solving for one, the intrinsics, or the extrinsics, or both. Um, but with this, we've, we've introduced our pinhole camera model. So we are saying that um, our X location, so our X and Y location on the image in pixels, right, in pix units of pixels, is the application of the pinhole camera model to some world coordinate in 3D, UVW, with some complicated Greek parameters, right? So we've got our variables all wrapped up in there. Now, this is all very nice when you're talking about a theoretical single point, my pen cap, right, being the, the middle of the pen cap being a single point projecting precisely onto some place on your image plane. Of course, uh, things are potentially complicated. Um, we do have a lens in there. The lens might be making things a little fuzzy uh, because um, each little part of the sensor, right, each little uh, CCD element, right, it actually has a little bit of surface area. It's not a theoretical point. So it's capturing light in this sort of expanding cone uh, going through the lens. So it's capturing even more uh, light that way. And so the result of that is that a single point in the world may be projecting onto uh, a disk of locations on your image plane. Similarly, maybe the object is moving a little bit, maybe uh, there's a little bit of error in your parameters. So overall, we're going to say, okay, there's a normal distribution on X. There's some uncertainty about exactly where X is landing. It's going to have uh, some mean and some variance. The mean, obviously, is determined by our pinhole camera law that we just introduced. And the variance, well, that'll depend on your point spread function, it'll depend on your, your optics and things like this. So we'll have some sigma squared times the identity matrix. So yes, we now have one more variable potentially to worry about, um, but we, we will probably typically keep this pretty fixed uh, just to keep things simple. So now we have our probabilistic model, right, which is discriminative or generative? Generative, right? We're saying, well, if it were discriminative, we would know the probability of W given X, but obviously we're going to have to go around this roundabout way where we generate things by projecting the world state through the camera, seeing where it lands, and saying, okay, there's some Gaussian distribution around that. So we're, we're going to have this probability of X given W and the parameters. This is our, this is our probabilistic model that we're going to work with. Now, um, we will, you will probably not see the normal distribution in most textbooks, but you will see it uh, in many papers where they talk about trying to, to solve the problems we're about to introduce. All right, uh, one last thing which we'll mention, you should always keep in mind, uh, and we're, we're going to sort of not worry about it in, our, uh, in, in most of our work. We're gonna keep this separate, uh, as if it's a, a sort of um, deterministic process that we can control. And that is namely radial distortion. Radial distortion, you can tell you're, you're experiencing it if something that should be a straight line actually looks curved. If it were, if it were an image without radial distortion, or if you took this image and corrected it, it would look like this. You'd have a straight line for that for that thing in the real world that is a straight line. Radial distortion is due to our lenses, right? Uh, being, being somewhat curved, you pay a lot of money to get cameras that have very little uh, lens distortion, or 
Uh, another alternative is to use the lens you have, but only use the very middle part of it, so you're not experiencing the distortion, which happens to sort of accumulate near the near the edges. Um, or you can get a GoPro camera, which is you know all about lens distortion, uh, you know 170 field degree field of view, and it's uh, no, no nothing looks like a straight line. Um, but you could figure out how to compensate for the lens distortion. And this is uh, for the radial distortion, also known as lens distortion. The, uh, there's a lot of value in doing that. And I would say, let's assume that for all of our purposes, our images are handed to us already after someone has done this correction, this lens undistortion. But going forward, the, the process goes like this. You have some x coordinate. Something is supposed to land on your image plane, a point supposed to land on your image plane in, in a very specific place. And you say, great, well that's where I'm going to see it. Not quite. Dependent on the radius, how far we are from the principal point going out in all directions, that is going to be the, the, the variable r. Depending on r, you're going to have more, if beta is high, or less radial distortion. So. Uh, this is a typical polynomial equation used to model lens distortion. It usually uses only uh, the second and the fourth powers. And it's the same transformation for x as it is in y, because the problem with lens distortion is the same whether you're going x or y or in between. It's, it's affecting everything based on the distance from our, our principal point. Our principal point, not necessarily the, the center of the image, right? This is another reason we have to compensate for that principal point offset. So, um, if someone hands you a warped image, you can undo this, this transformation if you can figure out your beta 1 and beta 2. You have to take into account the different channels. The different color channels? Yeah, chromatic. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, unless you're worried about chromatic aberration of some type. You are worried about chromatic aberration of some type. Well, if we're not including <laughs> this, so is that also something that we're just not including, or is it not a problem with photography? It, it is something we are not including, in, and I don't think we even talk about it very much in computational photography. I think we've mentioned it, and we, we, we move right past it. Uh, chromatic aberration <coughs> can be a problem. I have, I've calibrated a lot of cameras, and let's say my, my calibration errors were usually small, but too big for chromatic aberration to be to be the culprit and needs to sort of say, oh, that's that's the problem. Um, it's a it's a fine question. Okay, so lens radial distortion. Uh, obviously, if you're in a special effects company, you're in the perverse situation of getting footage from some film director, having to undo the lens distortion, render your 3D graphics and stuff correctly, and then at the end redo the lens distortion so that the footage matches up with <laughs> the rest of the film. Uh -huh. So uh, very valuable to know your parameters uh, beta, and there are methods for calibrating that sort of independently of everything else. Yes? What's on the warped um, coordinates? What about the warped coordinates? Yeah. The, the prime yeah. and the warped. Yes. So the, the question, if you didn't hear, the question was which are the warped coordinates there are the primes? And how do you yes. specify the, the parameters? How do we learn the parameters? Yeah. Ah. Say lines and curves and try to map them onto Yeah, the we're going to take some calibration objects to do that. So we'll use the same calibration. One can use the same calibration objects that we're going to use for the other intrinsic, uh, to estimate the other intrinsic parameters. So I count this as. I guess I'm, I'm making this distinction. There are intrinsic parameters intrinsic to the camera, right? If you don't change the focal length, so if you just leave that there. That camera has a fixed set of intrinsic parameters. I'm going to say there's the radial distortion ones, and then there's the rest. Both of them you would you would learn uh, by looking at calibration objects. Let me just check my time. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce at least the first geometric uh, problem. Uh, maybe this will be actually quite quick because we're going to go through these three problems uh, again and again in different in different ways. The first one, learning the extrinsic parameters. Someone has told you about your camera. They've told you all your your intrinsic parameters. You already know capital lambda. 
and you're just trying to figure out the rotation and the translation, the maximum likelihood rotation and translation that increases the probability of projecting your world point I onto your image location I. This assumes that you have a correspondence, that you know the 3D location of a point and where it projected to in your image for a number of points, so I, I points. So we're just using our, our generative model here. We're saying, okay, maximize the probability or maximize the log, it's equivalent, right? And we're treating each point that we've observed independently. So we, we know we have these trees and graphs and, and so on, but for now there's nothing really relating the individual points to each other, right? That's a 3D point, that's a 3D point projected onto the image. Uh, except that they're all being projected through this same, this same pinhole camera model. And therefore, they're all experiencing the same transformation. Um, apparently in French it's called suffering, the same transformation, rotation, and translation. In practice, what this looks like is someone has told you the 3D world location of a few different points, these three points. And they've told you the intrinsics of your camera, so you know your focal length and you know your scale factor. But if you have your if you have the wrong rotation and the wrong translation, then this point will think it's projecting down there. This one will think it's projecting here, when in fact it should have projected up here. That's where we detected that point. So this is implying we have this correspondence between each W. Uh, that's, let's say W2 and X2, that's W1, and it's not projecting to X1. If you get it right, if you find the maximum likelihood, and it's, a, it's the correct maximum likelihood, then you'll find that that W point, in fact, projects to exactly where we predicted it would. So, in problem one, we're just trying to estimate the rotation and the translation. Uh, and maybe that's a good place to stop. Problem two we'll pick up with on Thursday. Please, uh, does everybody have a